line is a hybrid system, right? Now, true, because of the pandemic, we have the hybrid system where you can do online and you can also do um, physical church. But online is not supposed to be a substitute, but a supplement because they continued in fellowship. We are believers to fellowship. You can't just say, I join on my Instagram people. I, I like what you do. But you must have fellowship. You must have human beings that you meet with. You must have physical pastor that you know, that you can touch and feel his hands or her hands. You must have fellowship. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That word doctrine, I said, is the apostles' teachings and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. The breaking of bread was not necessarily only communion. It was just eating rice and beans and stuff they were doing there. That's breaking of bread. They enjoyed themselves, came together, and that's why we say we are starting home centers and in prayers. That's why we do 6.30 a.m. morning prayers. So all this is part of our faith. It's not that, oh, Pastor Ladi wants to do church, so we decided to do church like this. No, it's what they handed over to us. Morning prayers, continue to read the word of God, is part of what it means to be a Christian. If you don't want to be a Christian, even if you want to be another faith, they have their own. So there's no way you miss it. If you live here and say you want to be something else, it's still the same thing. So we were telling us and we, told, we, we began to speak about the priority of God's word, putting priority to God's word. You say you are busy, you are busy. When something hits you, I've said this before, we're always talking about um, um, we don't have, um, what do we call it now? Um, short attention span. It's, it's okay. I understand that. But if you are going to do an exam where you will give you one or two point something million naira per week, your attention span will increase. Won't it increase? When you were reading for your exam, your attention span increased because if daddy told you if you fail, yeah. Attention span will increase. So if you want to be, if you say you want to be a true Christian, someday, even before in the Old Testament, they made Sunday Sabbath. Don't do any other thing. Just serve God. Now, we don't say don't just do anything. You can do many things. But the way we have put God at something not important, then when challenges come, we run to... That's why they can take advantage of us, actually. Because I, I, sometimes I don't blame only the people who deceive. The ones who are also being deceived is because... They want to be deceived. It's because they decide not to follow through with the word of God. Amen. Amen. So now we are on a new series called The Blessed Life. The Blessed Life. Tell, tell somebody you are blessed. You are blessed. You are blessed. Tell somebody you are blessed. You are blessed. The Blessed Life. The Blessed Life. The Blessed Life. Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Let's, let's, let's be Bible students. Um, is it okay to be Bible students? Okay, Genesis 26 from verse 12. Genesis 26 from verse 12. Genesis 26 from verse 12. You know, Genesis 26 from verse 12. And then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold. You know, many people have said this so is finance and all those things. It's just that he went to plant mango or whatever. It's not necessarily money. Right, sowing is not necessarily money. So then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Verse 13, 13, verse 13. And the man was great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Verse 14, verse 14, verse 14. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of head and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. The Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped and filled them with earth. Now, let me tell you something. You, Somebody who may be looking for a calling, one of the callings that every believer has is the calling to be blessed and be a blessing. It's as simple as that. Tell your neighbor, I'm blessed to be a blessing. Okay, now, and Abraham and Abimelech said unto Isaac, go from us. That means it was not about 
there was an aura Isaac carried that made whatever he touches to prosper. No matter, you remember just before this verse, they says that they, they, they wells, they began to put dirt in it so that it would not produce. But the Bible says that at a particular point, and Abimelech said unto Isaac, go from us. Thou art much mightier than we. Thou art much mightier than we. That means they, there was an aura of God's favor and grace upon his life that even the naysayers, you know, they didn't say Isaac went to say, oh, my enemies die. The more they attacked him, the more he grew stronger. Are you hearing me? So it takes a mentality. Remember that Isaac is the son of who? Ah, we don't, you see now. Isaac is the son of who? Okay. Thank God. If somebody said Moses, yeah, I would have. Okay. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, go from us. That means there is a grace upon your life that even though we are trying to stop you, you keep on getting better. You see? There is, and that is the blessed life. Remember, Abraham believed the gospel in a type and in the shadow in the Old Testament. Right? Are we there? What made Abraham righteous in the Old Testament? What made him Abraham righteous in the Old Testament? Yes. Right? Did he follow all the laws of Moses? Was it because he used to sacrifice a lot? Abraham believed... No, say it now. We are Bible scholars. Abraham believed and it was for righteousness. Right? And remember that we are blessed with faithful Abraham because we believe the same gospel that Abraham believed. Even though Abraham was in the Old Testament, Abraham believed the gospel as in a shadow. Do we believe that? Right. So all those things were just types and shadows. Now, because of that, what he believed, it was accredited to him for righteousness. And the Bible says that Abraham was blessed to be a what? A blessing. Because... He believed the gospel. Are we there? The gospel of grace, which is the gospel of Christ, Abraham believed it and began to function in the blessings of God. Now, Isaac, remember, Abraham was so blessed that at one point when the Bible talked about um, God came to him and said, leave your father's house and I'll show you a place and all that. And he left, and he left with Lot. And they were growing bigger and bigger. Lot felt he was smarter, right? And Lot's, Lot's um, um, personnel and Abraham's people started to have a fight. So they decided, you know, Abraham said, let's not continue like this. Let, let's separate and let's have, you know, so that we don't have fights amongst ourselves. And let us separate our ways so that, because we are both increasing. Now, Lot thought he was a sharp guy. And he looked at the situation and he calculated it based on statistics that if I should choose this fertile land, what will happen is that I will be better off. So Lot chose a seemingly fertile land that became a land that Abraham had to help him. But Lot chose a better land. Abraham told him, Abraham did argue, you think you can deceive me, Lot? I brought you out from I, I helped your destiny, now you want to outsmart me. No. Why? Because the blessing is you. You are the blessing. That's why I'm always telling you, why do you have to pour oil inside your business? It's, it, is, it is a lack of understanding of what you carry. Any, every Holy Ghost you ever need is already inside you. Every power you will ever need is already inside you. Unto him that is able to do exceedingly above what we ask or imagine according to the powers in the heavens. No, the, according to the power that is in the inside of the believer. Philemon wants it, that the communication of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you. Most of the time, why believers don't get successful in their life is because they are always looking for outside things to validate who they are. 
Because everything the believer requires for life and godliness is already in the inside of the believer. Second Peter 1 verse 2, put it up. Second Peter 1 verse 2. Second Peter 1 verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through how? Okay, listen to this. Grace is God's best towards you. Everything that a man would ever need is wrapped up in God's grace. Did you hear what I said? God wants to meet the needs of man. In order for him to meet the needs of men, he decided that the word grace is the word that encompasses my total disposition to solve man's problems. That's why the Bible says the law was given by Moses, but grace came through Jesus Christ, which is Jesus. It now says grace and peace. The more you grow as an adult, you realize, you realize that that peace is, is stronger than some amount of money. One million dollars cannot buy peace. So it says grace and peace is cascaded or multiplied unto you, is very, very important. True, the knowledge of God. I keep on hammering these things because I believe that God has raised certain individuals. You see, uh, let me not get ahead of myself. The message of Christ comes with his own methods. You can be preaching the message of grace and be using the methods of the law, which is manipulation. When you preach grace, grace has its own methods. And the method of grace is that you have to be sound doctrinally. Any person that wants to understand grace must be a committed Bible scholar um, 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 student. If you say, I like this grace, I like grace, you know, God has forgiven me, I'm the righteousness of God. But you don't want to be taught, you don't want to learn, you don't want to grow in grace. Because to grow in grace is to grow in the knowledge of God. Are we there? Yes, so it says, grace and peace is multiplied to you primarily through the knowledge of God. Somebody say, I know God now, I prayed all night. Well... And of Jesus our Lord. Now, the knowledge of God and that word and is used the Kai rule of Bible interpretation. The knowledge of God, which is, that is, of Jesus our Lord. Only in Christ do we have the knowledge of God. You say, Pastor, that's not true. Second Corinthians 4 verse 6. Second Corinthians 4 verse 6. Because many people feel that, you know, just knowing Jesus is not enough. You know, let's preach other things. No. The more of Jesus you see, the more blessed you become. Listen to this. The more of Christ that is unveiled in the Bible to you, the more manifestations of what he has purchased for you, you see in your life. So that is why the whole essence of coming to church is to grow and to know him says, for God who had commanded the light to shine out of darkness had shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where? In the face of Jesus Christ. John 1, 17. John 1, 17. John 1 from verse 17. John 1, verse 17. John 1, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Verse 18. See how Jesus is putting, I, I know law, the law came from Moses, but I didn't bring the law. I brought what is called what? Grace. No man, this is a very, very powerful statement. No man had seen God at any time. That means he's telling the Pharisees that Moses that you are trusting, he never really saw God. That is an insult to the Pharisees because they were exposed to the Old Testament, right? And they believed that the prophets of old, they received the oracles of God. How can you say, who are you, Jesus, to say that Moses did not see God? 
But someone said, but who now appeared to Moses and gave Moses the Ten Commandments and all the laws? Do you want to find out? Acts 7, 38, put it up. Moses never really saw God. I will show you why. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall be the Lord your God, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Now let's look, move to 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, not God, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the Larry oracles to give unto us. So Moses never, it was an angel that appeared to him on Mount Sinai. Acts 7, 53, that same chapter, let's move to 53. Who have received the law, how? By the what? Angels. Hebrews 2, 2, put it up. Hebrews 2, 2. I'm going somewhere with this. So Moses never really saw God. And I'll show you. After this, we go to Hebrews 1. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward. What was the word spoken? Let's look at verse 1. Let's look at verse 1. Go back to verse 1. Hebrews 2, 1. Therefore, we ought to give more energy to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. He was talking, comparing the gospel with the law. Move to verse 2. Move to verse 2. For the word spoken by angels, what was this word? It was the word that Moses received. Verse 3, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now, he says the word that was spoken by angels. So it was Moses and angels that communicated in the disposition of the law or the giving of the law. Amen. So Moses really never saw God. Now, the Bible calls God the immortal that dwelleth in unapproachable light, which no man has seen or can ever see. Did you hear what I said? No man has seen or can ever see. Now, Colossians 1.15. I'm establishing that knowing God brings grace and peace multiplied in your life. But knowing God is not just prayer and fasting. Knowing God is to see Jesus from the pages of the scripture. Are we there? Who is the image of the image? Invisible God. Can something that is invisible have an image? It's not supposed to be, right? So, that means only Christ can give visibility to God. That's why Philip was saying, show us the Father and it will suffice us. He said, once you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because I'm the father revealed. I am the only God you will know is in the person of Jesus. That's why Isaiah said he's the prince of peace. Everlasting, mighty, everlasting father, mighty God. You need to go back to, maybe we'll be, that's why we need to join believers class. Some of us, when we were in university, we're studying the word of God as we have come out. Now I know life, too many things drawing you here and there, but we still need to stay with the word. So it's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. That means the, the Bible, I always say, is a Christocentric book with a Christocentric message. The Bible is a Christocentric book with a what? If you don't, the Bible is about a person. Until the person is revealed, you have not really read the word of God. Okay. John 5, verse 39. I'm always quoting the scriptures, but it's good for us. Let us see it. John 5, verse 39. But the Bible, someone is saying, how does this work with living a blessed life? You see, most of the people praying for blessings, 
sometimes never ever get it. But once Jesus seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, uh, you know many of us think that that his righteousness it means that we seek um, to do good, which is okay. There's no problem in doing good. But his righteousness is talking about the righteousness that is by faith in Christ Jesus. Seek to understand the righteousness that is by faith. In that, all these things that the Gentiles are seeking after will be added unto you. Now, you see, it says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. Not in them you have. When I read this scripture, I'll say in them you have. No, you think, Jesus is telling the Pharisees and Sadducees, you think you have eternal life, but they are they that testify of me. Jesus is speaking. That means the essence of the scripture is to testify about the person of Jesus. That's why we read 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make thee wise unto starting a multinational company. No. Able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, will God empower you to have natural wisdom and give you direction so you are fruitful in your company you want to build? Yes. But if you think that it is from church that you will learn everything on how to build a company, that's where believers, and that's where Nigeria sometimes, we don't progress. See, science is not anti-God. Logic is not necessarily anti-God. So, God empowers you. We have talked about it with this grace-based leadership initially. God empowers you. I said, even though the wisdom of God is supernaturally derived, it will still be naturally applied. And most of the time, you, some people say, I have grace. I, I remember when I wanted to be an engineer, and I began to learn balance. You know, the first time, I was deceiving myself. You know, I did an exam, and in my heart... That was, that's one of the greatest deceit, self-deceit. I believed I would pass. Meanwhile, I wrote nonsense. So, you see how believers can be going down in life. So, I believe grace will cover me. When the results came, grace did not cover me. I was covered in shame. Now... As I began to grow in the knowledge of God, before I'll be making declarations, so what I did was this. I want to be a petroleum or a reservoir engineer. I took the job description of a reservoir engineer or a petroleum engineer. Lord, give me the capacity to do these things that is in the job description. Don't tell, don't say, I am, I am, I am. Okay, I want to be able to do this thing as other people are doing it. Why do you want to just... Avoid natural laws. Let me not deviate. They are they, the scriptures testify of me. So your goal as a believer is to see God through the lens of Christ. Once you do that, your dominion is sure because Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. Verse 40, verse 40. Jesus is the one speaking. This is not in red, but it's the one speaking. Believe me, in this particular. And you will not come to me. You go to the scriptures. They are reading the scriptures, but they are not seeing Jesus in the scriptures. Jesus is now saying, remember, when Jesus came, they didn't accept him. Remember, he's despised and rejected of men. Isaiah 53. He came to his own, and his own, his own is Israel. They didn't receive him, all the Pharisees. They wanted to stone him, kill him. They killed him now. Am I there? Right? Okay. It says, and you will not come to me that you might have life. So you can be reading the scriptures and not see who the scriptures is pointing you to. Amen. And you will not come to me that you might have life. So life is in a person. And the person 
of Jesus. Now, John 5 verse 45, put it up. John 5 verse 45. John 5 verse 45. Do not think, now Jesus is the one still speaking. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Now, these are people who trusted, I'm going somewhere with this, I'm building something. You know, who trusted in the law of Moses. They trusted, now, I told you that when you see the word scripture, the scripture is not the entire Bible. The scripture is Genesis to what? Okay, you see some of us still don't know these things. That's Genesis to Malachi. Why? When the Bible says you do err not knowing the scripture nor the power of God in Matthew, Matthew was not yet written. So what, when Jesus said, in these days, this scripture fulfilled in your ears, where he went to the temple and was preaching. In Luke, Luke was not yet written. So what was, what was the book Jesus was holding? Is it making sense now? So when you say the word scripture, it's talking about the... Okay, so it's now saying these Pharisees, they had the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. You know, Old Testament, in our, as they used to divide it. Hmm? So they had the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. Now, when they say Moses, they say, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses. It's not that Moses is rising up every day to go and accuse us. That word Moses is talking about the law or the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, because that's who wrote it, Moses. So it says, it is the law that accuse you, accuses you whom you trust. You are rejecting me and saying, no, it's not you. I don't want you. You want Moses. Okay, it's Moses that is who accuses you. I do not, I'm not in the, I can never, God can never take the place of accusation in your life. So anytime accusation comes in or condemnation, the Bible calls the devil the slanderer or the accuser of what? So I will show us in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, that that is why the enemy uses the law and sin to bring death. Okay, but let's go further. Now, let's look at John 5, verse 46. Now, the next verse, Jesus is saying something very critical here. 46, 46. For had he believed Moses properly, listen to this, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Can somebody explain that scripture? John 5.45 just says here that there is one that accuses you before the father. Is who? Then Jesus is this saying, if you have still believed that Moses, you would have believed me for a what? Is that contradictory to us? Can somebody explain? What, does, what is Jesus trying to say here? Moses wrote about Jesus, but the same way Moses, the, before, the, the, the verse before this said, there's one that accuses you before the father, Moses. The same, and Jesus doesn't accuse. Now, he's saying that same Moses also wrote about Jesus. So, in the law of Moses, it's the condemnation or the Old Testament. In the law of Moses, is also the gospel. So, the Old Testament, therefore, is not really books. And the New Testament is not really books. Okay. The Old Testament is a relationship. The New Testament is a relationship. I'm coming, eh? The Old Testament is a relationship based on your performance to get to appease an angry God. The New Testament is a relationship based on Jesus' performance on the cross. So in the Old Testament, you can see the New Testament, and in the New Testament, you can see the Old Testament. So the way to be able to decipher is if this performance relationship exists. Because Jesus said the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But even in the New Testament, you will still see people operating the law mentality. Are we there? So even in the Old Testament... Hebrews 10, the Old Testament foreshadowed Christ. But no, leave it here. So Jesus is saying that the proper way to interpret the law of Moses is to see the person of Jesus in the law of Moses. Are we there? So the, the Old Testament has to be interpreted of the light in the light of Christ. Did you hear what I said? 
the Old Testament has to be interpreted in the light of Christ for it to be powerful. Remember, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. No, the laws that are in the Old Testament don't give eternal life. They testify of the person. The person of Jesus is eternal life. Let me tell you something. I've said it before. Eternal life is not a place. Eternal life is not eschatology. Eternal life is a person. What they call eternal life is Christ in you. Are we there? Once Jesus enters you, you have eternal life. We'll build it. Eh? Don't worry. We are building something. For if you have believed Moses properly, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. It's the same thing that saying, said the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They testify of me. He wrote of me. Are we there? John 1 verse 45. John 1 verse 45. Put it up. John 1 verse 45. I'm breaking things down. We are still on the blessed life. Philip found it, Nathaniel and said of him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So, they were reading the law of Moses, but they didn't see Jesus in the law of Moses. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets is that. First Peter 1 verse 10. First Peter 1 verse 10. Remember, so the, the assignment of the scriptures is to reveal the person of Jesus. The whole essence. That's why I said the Bible, for those who remember, the Bible is a word. Theology, the theology of the Bible is what? Come, we are, we, are, we are bold as a lion. Christology, right? Christology will lead us to what? Soteriology. Don't leave all the logics and don't make it look complicated. Theology is the study of the nature of God, the character of God. To arrive at God's proper, to understand God's proper nature and his character, you have to see it through Christ. That's why the theology of the Bible is Christology. If you see God through Elijah, you have not seen God. And you call fire. That's what's happening. So the Pharisees were seeing God through Elisha and Moses. Are we, are we there? And still today, some people are still seeing God through that light. But, the, but there is glory. You see, some people will say, but people who are preaching all these things, there is still glory. There is glory. I will show you in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. Can we go there? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 7. TPT. There is glory in the Old Testament, but the enslavement outweighs the glory. I will give you an example. <laughs> Can I go there? There are many people, there are many churches where healing, there is healing taking place, which is good, it's glory. But Nigeria doesn't have a proper medical system. Can you see? I, I, will, I will explain further. Now, I am not castigating any person. But we are trying to move to understand God's grace, especially in this part of the world, where we preach the law a lot. Now, I've been even part of it. We are preaching the law a lot, and it seems we have glory. But the country, people are being healed supernaturally, but we can't build a proper medical system. Now, the truth is that, let me say this with all humility. Vaccines have kept people more alive, more than healing, supernatural healing. Do you believe it or not? I know it's, you know, it's hurting you, that, but it's the truth. God is not, nobody is saying you should not work in supernatural healing. But if you receive the wisdom of God, you'll be able to work in supernatural healing. And even the people in the pews that come to church will also have wisdom because they understand grace to build leadership and build systems that beyond the healing can bring about economic and communal prosperity. 
That is a change of, that's what grace does. It's not just the healing. It changes mindset, changes people from the inside out. Are we there? For when even the ministry that was characterized by chisel letters on stone tablets came with a dazzling measure of glory. Yes, this is Old Testament. Though it produced death, there was still glory inside. So I know people like asking, I used to ask the question, but people like, this person preaches that people will die, this person preaches, that doesn't make it right. The fact that there's glory in it, that doesn't make it right. Because you share your testimony, but you are the same person that will backstab and are ready to kill another person to go higher. That's not glory. Even though you have testimony. Are you hearing me? Because God is more interested in who you are becoming than what you are acquiring. So, though it produced, it had a measure of glory, but it produced death. So, the Old Testament is a ministration of death. Until people are changed from the inside out, Christianity will forever be hypocrisy. Let's go back to 1 Peter 1.10. We're in 1 Peter 1.10. I'm building something there, and I need to build it properly. 1 Peter 1.10. Of which salvation the prophets of old have inquired. That means the Psalms, the, 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 the Jeremiah, the Isaiah, the Elijahs, and all these people. They have inquired and searched diligently. Who prophesied in the Old Testament of the grace that should come where? Are we please give me a good response. Prophesied of the grace that should come unto. Yes. So in the Old Testament, there is grace. Do we see that? Because the prophets in the Old Testament prophesied of the grace. They did understand it, but as the Spirit will lead them, Isaiah will say, is wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes ye are healed. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. All these things were types and shadows that were prophesying about the Messiah and how people will be saved by faith through grace. Now, it says, they searched diligently and prophesied of the grace. That's why when Jesus came and said, he says, the law was given by Moses. That was not my intent. But grace, go back to John 1, 17. But grace came through Christ. Now, he's trying to tell you that the law that you are holding to, there's no grace in it. I have brought grace. And that grace, I said, grace is beyond the message. Grace is God's character. And Jesus, okay, okay, okay. He said, for the Lord was given by Moses, but grace and truth, grace, which is the truth, exist in the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, now look at verse 18. No man, that means Moses did not really see God properly. Remember, as we see God, is still in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We are transformed, right? The, we are blessed. It says, no man had seen God at any time. The only begotten son, hallelujah. Are we looking at this scripture? Which is the bosom of the father. He had what? Declared him. So Jesus unveils God to man. Jesus is God revealing God. Jesus is God expressing God's will for man. So, same thing. The Old Testament is prophecies, promises, types, and shadows. The New Testament is the fulfillment of the shadows of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is Jesus concealed. That's why the Pharisees couldn't see it. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. The Old Testament is death, guilt, and condemnation. The New Testament is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's why Paul said, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. 
to the Jews first and to the Greek. It now says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Why does the gospel have power? The gospel of Christ has power because therein, right standing with God is obtained only in the gospel of Christ. Abraham believed God and it was a credit to him for and because he had right standing with God, he lived a blessed life. He didn't pray too much. His right standing with God gave him access. There's this guy, what's his name? You see, the presence of God will make you fruitful. So God says, in order for these people to be fruitful, they have to have a right standing with me. Because when you have a right standing or a perfect heart with God, righteousness is the ability to stand before God without a sense of guilt, fear, and condemnation. That is only in the gospel. Now, Akas, 1 Corinthians 15.55. You put up that thing that I told you to put up quickly. But 1 Corinthians 15.55, put it up quickly. Now, I said something that one of the things that will always frustrate you from manifesting all God has planned for you is condemnation and guilt. Wrong emotions. Am I, am I communicating? Okay, let me see. Let me say this. Most of the time, when you are not achieving your goals in life, it's because of wrong emotions operating behind the scenes. Are we there? Are we there? You don't feel less of yourself and go for a presentation, and, and the presentation will be good. Am I right or wrong? Okay. Now, let me show you how this works. O death, where is thy? O grave, where is thy? Okay, let's move to verse 56. The sting of death is what? Remember, John 10.10, 10, the thief, that thief was not really speaking about the devil. You know, there's a lot to learn. The thief there was speaking about false teachers, right? But the devil uses those false teachers, right? He says, the thief cometh to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that he may have life and life in abundance. Now, he says the sting of death, opposite of what God does, the sting of death is what? Now, that word sting there is talking about a poison, right? Like a venom, Right? What death uses, in quote, to kill you is the venom of sin. Is this making sense? Should I repeat that? The venom. So if, for example, a snake bites somebody and, you know, he has that wrong or poison in him, the thing begins to move through all his system and probably shuts down some organs and all that. Now, there are different snakes, right, with different power or level of poison. There's some that if they bite you, you can survive easily. But there are some that once they bite someone, they have to rush the person quickly. It now says that the poison that death uses is sin. And the strength of that poison is what? Look at it. What is it now? Okay. The strength of the poison that death uses to reign in our life is the law. Why? Anytime the favor of God is being frustrated in your life, it's because most likely you are walking in condemnation and fear. Put, those, put that um, graph now. Sin... Death, law, but behind all those things are self-sabotaging belief systems and emotions that is restricting you from living a blessed life. That's why Jesus said, there is therefore now no condemnation for them which are in where? Because eventually condemnation will lead to death. Now, this has spiritual and natural effects. Because 
The law, the strength of sin, we said is what? The strength of sin, we said is what? See it. The law. That means the law will magnify your weakness or weaknesses. That is why both Moses and the devil are called accuser of the brethren. They do the same thing. Because the devil is meant to steal, kill, and destroy. The law is the tool for the enemy. That's why they call the devil, if you look at Ephesians 6, another word they use for the devil is what they call a deslanderer. That means he's always telling you what you are not. You are not good enough. You are not strong enough. You are not enough. You are not enough fear, condemnation, anxiety, over criticism, self sabotaging emotions are behind the scenes that brings death into our lives. Now, go back to the scripture, 2 Corinthians 15 55. The sting of death is in the strength of sin is the law. Now, let's look at 57. Glory to God. That is why the cure for sin is not sinlessness or emotions. The cure for sin is righteousness. He that had no sin was made sin that you might become the righteousness of God. Someone say, it's because you don't understand what the righteousness is. It's not the same thing. Sinlessness and righteousness is not the same thing. Righteousness is that I brought you in right standing with me because of what I did, not because of what you did. And that right standing you have with me empowers you to live a victorious life. Now it says, and now it says, and thanks be to God which giveth us victory, glory to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. How does he give us victory? Hebrews 2.12, put it up. Hebrews 2.12, Hebrews 2.12. You know, um, Larry Olushola was here, and, and a lot of people were asking this question. If you are preaching this grace, 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 people will just be, you know, committing sin, and, you know, they will not be able to differentiate it. You see? He really explained it. You are what you focus on. I'll show you in Hebrews 10. The more sin conscious you are, the more sin you commit. If you are focusing on your sin, and some people feel it's very holy. I'm not trying to say we don't accept. We run to God. But the law will not actually make you run to God. I'll show you how. Okay, the Pharisees caught a woman caught in adultery. They brought the woman to Jesus. According to the law, she's supposed to be stoned to death. Jesus was in a fix. He was writing something on the earth. He stood up and said, He that is without sin, let him cast the first. Now, nobody was without sin. The woman accepted that she had committed sin, was leaning down in front of Christ. Jesus says, go and sin no more. The question I have, which we may not have looked at, those ones that decided they will live, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. The Bible says, each of them began to live one after the other. If I was a Pharisee, I would be like the adulterous woman and go and meet Christ and receive forgiveness. That means the law will make you want to keep what you have and continue in it. Why didn't the Pharisees now go and meet Jesus that forgive me of my sins? So, he that, so they took that their sin behavior with them. So the law does not necessarily make you a better person. You just become a better hypocrite. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. 13, 13 quickly. Remember, and again, I'll put my trust in him, and behold, I and the children the Lord given me, had given me. Verse 14. For as much then, now see how Jesus dealt with that evil tree. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power over death, that is the devil. I said this thing is like vaccination. They use the same thing to 
inject to cure or neutralize the effect. So, like I was saying, Jesus didn't go and fight Satan in hell. His death is what disarmed Satan and his influence. And what is the influence of Satan? Remember, the sting of death is what? Okay, you see, this thing is like, um, what's that thing called in mass? Let's go back again so that we'll be understanding it. The sting of death is what? Fantastic. And Jesus is saying here in this scripture that he became a flesh to destroy him that, that had the power over death. Who had the power over death? Yes. No, you can be confident. If you miss it, don't worry. There's, it's not, uh, there's no scores, right? Who had the power over death? The devil. And the sting of death is what? Sin. Okay. So, Jesus died in our place so that the sting of death, which is sin, will not have hold over us. Now, I said that the sting, the Bible says the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. And under this oppression is self-sabotaging emotions. Are we there? Are we there? Okay. So it says that he might destroy him that had the power over death. That is the devil. So the devil is in all that oppression. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. That's why he's the accuser of the brethren as well. Now let's move to 15. 15. Let me close with this. 15 quickly. And deliver them who through the fear. Is fear not a negative emotion? Who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So grace, I said, the law will always bring fear in you. I've not fasted enough. I've not paid my tithe enough. Um, will this plane crash because I've not paid my tithe? Will God accept me to heaven? Some people have been Christians. That's why Christ is a bondage. Fear is a bondage. Because you are totally living all your life afraid of making hell or missing heaven. Or what was it called? That's how a particular bishop said, how can I be 40-something years in ministry and I can't beat my chest that I will make it to heaven? They say, that God is, is, I should not serve him. So, the fear, so Jesus said, that is why I said this before, the Bible says there is joy in heaven when one, if it was not final that that one soul has been saved forever. They will not have joy yet. Because they want to see whether you fall. But once you enter, you have entered. Glory to the Lamb of God. So, he says, he eliminates the fear of death. How? First John 4, 18. We'll close there. First John 4. Because fear puts us in bondage. I've given that testimony before. That when we were in a flight, the lady was scared and holding my hand. Because it seems like fire was coming from the back. And when we eventually landed, God healed, I mean, saved us and all of that. Just imagine what the lady was saying. She said she was confessing all her sins. And she remembered in that place, thousands of feet above sea level, what she remembered was the money she used to pick from her husband's bag. That as she's on this plane now, God, please forgive me for taking all the money that I took in my husband's purse and all of that. That was the fear that she was thinking of while she was on the plane. Can you just imagine? It puts us in bondage. Now, look at what Jesus has done. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is no fear in love. Perfect love, which is only in Christ Jesus, casted out fear for because fear had torment. He that feareth is not made perfect what? Put verse 19. Put verse 19. Glory to God. Put verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. There is no fear in love. Let's look at NLT back in that 18. NLT. Such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels, glory to God, all fear, all negative emotions, all wrong belief systems. I am healed. 
Whatever I require for life and godliness is already in the inside of me. I am not a failure begging to succeed. What my life looks like is not the reflection of my potential. If Christ be for me, if God be for me, who can be against me? He justified me. He glorified me. Sanctified, holy, righteous, blameless, eternity secure. If that doesn't get you excited, what gets you excited? If that is not enough, what is enough? Jesus has made, that's why I say the greatest of the fear every human being has is that they will die one day. Jesus took that fear out. Because that there is resurrection. You will not die and never exist again. No. You will have eternal life. Glory to the Lamb of God. If you are excited about this love, about this reckless love, about this unforgiving love, about this kind love, can you stand up on your feet and begin to sing this song? No, no shadow you will light up. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. No wall you won't kick down. Light won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, no shadow. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. No wall you won't kick down. Good night.